here at ISNTD Bytes. I'm here with three of the founders of the Viral Pseudotype Unit based at the University of Kent and at the University of Westminster here in central London. Um, can I just get you to introduce yourselves for the, for the uh, viewers? Okay, I'm uh, Dr. Nigel Temperton. I started at Kent about seven years ago now, and one of my ambitions has been to really push forward the use of viral pseudotypes for multiple sectors, hence um, putting together the, the, the viral pseudotype unit. Okay. I'm, I'm Dr. Simon Scott. I've been at the University of Kent for 10 years now. I've been in virology for 30 years, working on all sorts of things from DNA to RNA viruses. My background's really in vector development and recombinant viruses, and I uh, became associated with uh, Dr. Tempton here five years ago, and we started off this uh, enterprise. Uh, my name is Dr. Edward Wright. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster, and I had the uh, pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Tempton at uh, UCL, where I started working with pseudotypes and rabies. I've moved now on into looking at Ebola pseudotypes and using these to answer sort of basic science questions science questions and through to vaccine and antiviral uh, efficacy studies. Okay. Well, we've had the pleasure of having Edward speak in terms of the VPU, uh, the viral pseudotype unit, um, a couple of years ago now oh, yeah, at, yeah. at a vector control yeah. meeting that we put on here in London. Could I just ask you to give us a very quick overview of the pseudotype, you know, your technology in a nutshell? Uh, well, the technology that we use between uh, the two labs uh, is basically putting a different coat onto uh, a core virus. So we typically would use HIV, a uh, lentivirus, and onto that put the uh, coat of the virus that we're interested in, be it influenza or rabies virus. But this is a sort of uh, disabled virus. It's harmless. It's not able to replicate. Uh, but you can track it by the incorporation of a reporter gene, and this allows studies to be undertaken at much sort of uh, more basic laboratories without high containment for some very nasty viruses. Um, thank you for that overview. You mentioned, uh, Nigel, you mentioned different sectors, and that's actually very interesting here because obviously here you've got the disease side and the vector side here today in one meeting. I'm assuming that, that they aren't the only two touch points for your pseudotype uh, technology to touch upon from a commercialization perspective. And I know that's a very big word, but in terms of the plan <coughs> for the VPU, what other sectors do you anticipate would be able to make use of your technology? Okay, so for, for sectors, I would say over the years, we've started initially collaborating solely with academic groups who are maybe looking at basic science um, of a virus and uh, looking at maybe identification of new targets for antivirals. But over the last few years, since we all uh, got together as a viral pseudotype unit, we've collaborated now extensively with uh, biotech companies, with pharma, both small and, 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 and large, and also with public and animal health labs. And we're primarily on the disease agent side. And as my colleague uh, Edward Wright mentioned, um, we are able to exploit these um, technologies for really very nasty viruses. For example, Ebola. My, my particular interest is in pandemic influenza and also uh, rabies. And more recently, I've started to look at uh, the coronaviruses. So MERS coronavirus and, and previously SARS coronavirus. So, so, so quite a range of different sectors and disease settings in terms of your approach. So how will that impact your commercialization? or potential commercialization pathway. And I ask that because we're not in the United States, mm -hmm. it's London, England. Mm -hmm. so the private equity landscape is a lot different to you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, and definitely the funding around that spirit is completely different to, to the situation in the States, as an example. You've got a very high-end, you know, technology-driven um, you know, approach, it's unique. How do you anticipate it to be commercialized? What's the kind of direction you're taking it into? Right, okay. yeah. mm -hmm. um, I think our, our interest really is that uh, we, are, we are academics and we're we, we believe in pseudotypes as a way of um, for screening antivirals, uh, vaccine efficacy studies, uh, we're, in, we're interested in diagnostics, uh, seroepidemiology, 
Um, and I think fundamentally what we were interested in promoting is the idea of using these types of assays to the world. <coughs> and um, I, I, th I think really what our focus is, 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 is we're wanting people to accept the fact that these are very, very useful tools and they may have their own reasons for, for, for working on these. Uh, that might be pure science, it might be very applied science. But, but the way that we're coming at it is we want to commercialise, I guess, to the extent that we are um, throwing the doors open for uh, sort of, uh, I guess, pay-for-service pay for assays, um, providing reagents for other people in other labs to work on the pseudotype system, and also training and going to other labs. Well, either have people in and be trained on the system internally, or going out to other labs and trying to establish them elsewhere. And really, I suppose, our, our main interest in is the funding coming from that to feed back into the system so we can expand our portfolio and produce n novel assays which can go out into the world. That's so right. I dare say, from that, the, the, the road to commercialisation in this case would be more academic. So partnerships with academic centres globally that would then use your system, would that be a correct assumption? Are they the type of partnerships that you're looking for right now? Well, not just academic, also public health laboratories and, and industry as well. Um, it's the expansion of the use of a system that we believe in um, across that whole range of, of areas. Can anybody else yes, so comment? Yes. So we've built up a, a, a existing uh, network of, of users, you might call them, um, through the past five years working uh, as the Bio Pseudotype Unit. And there's now you know, this demand with the ever increasing uh, interest in preparing for outbreaks, preparing for pandemics. And the pseudotype system uh, provides, uh, as we've explained, an opportunity to have a platform that can theoretically be applied to a vast majority of, of these outbreaks. And so for funding for developing this service or this uh, provision further, we are yes, looking to form partnerships with you know, a range of uh, different bodies but also seeking uh, research funding, uh, grant funding, to try and develop uh, the, the portfolio we have at the moment. And would you be, I mean, that sounds a very um, <coughs> noble um, path to commercialization, if you look mm -hmm. at it like that, as opposed to the usual private equity, get yeah. onto NASDAQ and get some. But would you be open to a drug company buying you? I mean, that's a horrible question to <laughs> ask you in the setting that we're talking about partnerships. But I can assume, uh, we can assume that a drug company would be interested in, you know, technology buyout, buying the pathway out. Would you be open to that, or is this more of a let's really establish some, you know, lab collaborations and get this moving in, in that way? I think as academics, we will be very averse to that. I think also if we had a, a commercial buyout, we would be <coughs> subservient to only those types of industries. And, and in fact, we, we want to really use this assay with, as I say, multiple sectors, and not always for profit either. For example, there are some uses in, in, in many resource-poor countries where you want to be able to, where many of our tools, we believe, from um, initial experiments can be used at very low cost to do very important immunogenicity studies for vaccines, for example, where the recipient would not be able to pay um, vast sums of money. So I think we'd rather stay in the academic sphere, but then collaborate with everybody, but on different terms, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very, very applicable to these, as you said, the resource poor end of the mm -hmm. uh, spectrum in terms of the, the low income, low to low income countries. With the recent uh, developments in Ebola, uh, dengue, and also now Zika, there seems to be more of a rush or a momentum towards cure. Your approach is not looking at the cure straight away. H how do you think that would fit in? So I think we are providing a, a tool that can be used to test, can be used to determine the potency of some of these sort of cures, some of these vaccines that are being developed. But there are basic scientific questions that still need to be answered to give us a better understanding of these viruses that uh, emerge that form these outbreaks. And without the infrastructure, without these basic uh, and advanced tools being generated to give us those answers, then it's going to make controlling, long-term control of uh, these viruses a lot more difficult. Okay, so it's more of an essential position in terms of the long-term research outlook on, on your technology. It's more of an essential part of the toolkit moving forward. 
That's really interesting. I mean, one of the things in terms of basic science is to be able to use pseudotype systems for receptor identification, for example. And thereby, once you've identified receptors, um, you, can, you can develop small molecule inhibitors against the receptors, mm. for example. Mm. Um, seroepidemiology, that w the problem with a lot of these virus infections is people have very, very acute infections. They may get um, a, a short rise in viremia and the circulating RNA, for example, from, from the virus like Zika. And then if you don't catch that window, you don't know whether somebody's had it or not. Yeah. Whereas antibodies leave an imprint and you should yeah. look for the in, you can look for the imprint. You can use pseudotypes to look for the long-term imprint of those people that have had them, for example. The other thing about our assays is that there are a lot of assays out there already that are, are basically binding systems. So they're looking for antibodies per se, in circulating antibodies, but they're not looking for biological activity. And we have, there are antibody neutralization assays out there which involve using the native virus, the pathogenic virus. We can do these functional biological assays looking for neutralization in a pseudotype system in a low biosafety containment facilities. So that opens the door for many other labs around the world to do that kind of work. So there's a lot of flexibility in there in the system. And is that where you are at the moment in terms of the plan? You mentioned other labs across the world, so there's obviously a desire for them to uptake, you know, to take up your, your approach. Is that where you are at the moment in terms of contacting, engaging with those particular labs or is that why you're here today? Yes, it, it is why, why we're here today because um, the whole idea is that you start off with a few agents that maybe you, um, you can exploit and you move those agents, uh, the, these new tools into different sectors. But then of course, as we know with emerging viruses, you've got so many new viruses coming online all of the time. And of course, we're interested to come to these sorts of meetings to find out what are the new pathogens and are these pathogens amenable to our systems and can we develop, develop rapid, um, as Dr. Scott said, neutralization assays or seroepidemiological assays that we can then quickly disseminate to whoever wants them, yeah. uh, whether they want to do basic um, epidemiology studies or whether they want to evaluate vaccines. So. If anyone would be interested in a partnership with you, can they contact you directly? Should we flash your email up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, email and also Twitter. Uh, yes, yes. And we, and we have a website which will be being revamped quite soon. Yes. But it, it yeah. is there, yeah. viralsuitotypeunit.info. Yeah.